accredited by the Aesthetic Practice Oversight Committee of the Ministry of Health Singapore in Aesthetic Procedures, Dr. Felix is guided by a personal philosophy that centers around empowering his patients through aesthetic improvements. He is also a firm believer that safety is paramount to the practice of aesthetic medicine, where the best results can only be achieved safely and consistently through the practice of well-proven, evidence-based methods, cutting-edge technology, and a sharp clinical acumen, all of which are used synergistically for tailoring each treatment to the specific needs of each individual patient. But enough from me. It's now time to pass the mic over to Dr. Felix for him to say a few words about himself, and we can then dive right in to answer those questions you have been waiting to ask. Dr. Felix Lee, please. Hello, hello. Let's start the ball rolling. So the first question is, what kind of Botox is used for the armpit? Well, in Singapore, there are three types of Botox that, that, that we use. Botox actually is just short for botulism toxin. It's not a brand. It refers to, to, to the, the drug. But there are three approved brands in Singapore. There's Elegant Botox, the so-called Botox. There's Dysport, and then there is Siomin. So at our clinic, we use... Elegant Botox, but then um, all, three, all three brands are, are good to use. The thing about Botox for the armpits is, right, it is at once a very fulfilling, but also a rather frustrating treatment because it's fulfilling because for patients who are troubled by hyperhidrosis, excessive sweating, whether it's in the armpits, on the palms, so on, Botox is an immediate cure. So the moment you do the treatment, right, you feel you, you immediately feel the sweat dry up significantly. So it helps a lot in terms of quality of life improvements. But the it can be quite frustrating because the effects are impermanent. So then it comes back. And then when you're injecting a large area like armpits or palms, right, it can be very painful, multiple injections. And it can also be quite pricey because each time you use, uh, each time you do a treatment, you are going to use up almost a bottle of Botox, 100 units, I'm talking about elegant Botox. So then it can be quite a pricey and painful treatment. So in the end, um, some patients don't really uh, keep, keep it up. La. They, don't, they, they don't manage to follow through with the treatment just because of pain and cost. But then when you actually start doing it, it's very, very rewarding. And then you can see what options you have subsequently if it helps. That's nice. So why do some people not get good results after using lasers for treating pigmentation? The most common reasons for not getting results after lasers, right, is, is, is an expectation thing. It's an expectation thing. So before you do your laser, you have to speak to your doctor, uh, an experienced doctor, to understand what, what exactly is the pigmentation you're talking about. Because there are many, many, many types of pigmentation. Some kind of, some of them can be treated in as little as one session, like a freckle. Um, some of them can be treated in a short series of sessions, things like Horace Neva, sunspots, and some of them, they will never be eliminated. The aim is always at control and regulation, things like melasma. So, um, what, so obviously, if you have the wrong expectation, then, then you may not be satisfied with the treatment. So if you expect melasma to disappear in one session, like freckles do, they, they, they are not gonna. And if you, it, it, maybe your friend did freckles, uh, laser for freckles and say, hey, you see one session cleared everything and you expect the same for your melasma. It won't happen because the type of implementation is different. So that is one, one common reason. The, um, the other reason would be using the wrong laser to treat the wrong indication. Yeah, so not every laser is the same and not every pigmentation is the same and obviously not every uh, laser treats every type of pigmentation. So there are many, many types of different lasers. The... Some lasers are ablative, they cut. Some lasers are non-ablative, they don't cut. And among the non-ablative lasers, which are more common in the treatment of pigments, um, they have different wavelengths, which means they target different chromophores in the skin. Some of them target melanin, which is black pigment. Some of them target hemoglobin, which is blood. And some of them target water, which is basically water under the skin. So um, lasers of different wavelengths target different types of of, of, of chromophores and they're absorbed by different stuff at different depths of the skin. So once again, the, the, there's no need to really um, go too much in depth about all of them. What you probably need to do is to find a professional doctor, understand what type of pigmentation you have, what are the treatment options, and find the treatment option that is most logical for you. Do you want your pigmentation gone fast? Then maybe you need something more aggressive. 
maybe you need something um, more aggressive doesn't just mean better results it actually also means more downtime or risk so on and so forth or do you or are you aiming at controlling your skin improving your complexion over time improving skin tone um, skin texture then you're looking at some a different type of laser so the most important thing therefore is to understand what type of pigmentation you have the different types of options available to you and just pick the one that's more sensible understood that means that when i if i have to actually go for a treatment it would be good to actually jot down maybe what machine have i used before if i would want to see some improvement at possibly a subsequent visit or a clinic right yeah it's quite true it's quite true okay great so we can I have the next question? After using a fractional laser, what, when, and for how long should we apply something to make it heal and achieve better results? Yeah, so um, fractional lasers, generally we use fractional lasers to treat um, things like acne scars, acne scarring. Sometimes it's used to do skin rejuvenation to improve the appearance of open pores. So uh, we're just going to talk about traditional fractional lasers like um, carbon dioxide lasers, CO2 lasers, or erbium, erbium lasers. The, after, what the laser does, right, is that it actually cuts a series in your skin, leaving behind intact skin in between, and that promotes the body, right, to repair the area that was damaged. So then, obviously, you are resurfacing the skin, and therefore, you will improve your, the appearance of acne scars, your open pores. You're also going to sort of like regenerate the skin so that's the that's the goal of this 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 laser the problem with fractional lasers is that ultimately you are cutting the skin see so um you want the skin to heal well and you want to avoid this complication called post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation or pih especially in asian patients especially in darker skin patients especially in the strong sun of singapore so i'm not i'm not i'm not a super big fan of of using ablative lasers unless it is like uh, unless the condition really recalls for it, as I mentioned, like deep acne scarring. Um, but let's say you have done an ablative laser. Now your face is, is red. There's, there's these grid lines on it. It's dry and sensitive. So what you want to do then is sun avoidance. Sun avoidance for the first few days up to a week. So you don't want, basically what you're trying to avoid, right, is prolonged sun exposure. So you can definitely walk from your car to your office, but you don't want to go to the park. You don't want to go to the beach for, for the whole day. Lah. Um in terms of in terms of skincare right the most important thing is so most of the time your doctor would already give you a post laser treatment regime in our case uh in our clinic we use rejuran we use rejuran but basically um different clinics we have different protocols the goal right is basically two things one one half of it right is hydration and the other half of it is sun protection so what's most important is a moisturizer moisturizer of any kind moisturizer of any kind to um protect the skin um, you know, restore moisture within the skin because it's it's cut, right? It's healing. So that barrier function is disrupted. You want to keep that skin barrier intact. So moisturizers of any kind all the time round the clock. Um, some blocks are really, really important. One interesting thing about fractional lasers is that if you know that you're going to go for fractional lasers and especially if you have had PIH before, you may want to pre-treat the skin. Let's say, I mean, if you're already on a antioxidant skincare then you're already on it. But sometimes people don't really use skincare all the time. Let's say guys who are treating their acne scars. So then you want to put, say, a vitamin C serum or some form of antioxidant serum on your skin for about a week before your laser treatment. And that actually reduces the risk of PIH um, after the treatment. So yeah, the 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 I would say the the the, the mainstay is moisturizer, sunblock, pre-treatment with antioxidants like vitamin C. Um, lifestyle stuff would be sun avoidance and lots of water. Um, for us, right, in our clinic, if we're trying to do skin rejuvenation, if we're not really, really trying to dredge up terrible deep acne scars, right, generally we use picosecond lasers. We use a picosure in our clinic instead of ablative lasers for this purpose because mainly because for Asian skin, right, our skin has more pigment. So in a, in a Caucasian patient, let's say, you can do ablative lasers many, many times and then um, for skin rejuvenation and it will it's unlikely to cause you problems like PIH or, or other, other issues. But in Asian skin, right, PIH is a real, is a real, is a real risk. And also if you keep, keep on doing ablative lasers, right, your skin can get more and more dry, more and more sensitive. So it starts becoming red and irritated. 
um, over time. So what we prefer to use is, is, is picosecond lasers because instead of cutting, I mean, this is an oversimplified way to say it, but instead of cutting grits on the skin to promote the skin repair, the picosecond laser generates this little damage, little damages called LIOBs, right? Under the skin. So it does the same thing in making the skin replace it with collagen, promoting repair and new collagenesis, but it leaves the surface of the skin intact. So it really um, has, a, like a, in my experience, at least a lower risk of, of PIH and sensitive skin as compared to uh, CO2 lasers. And since we're asking about downtime, it also has a shorter, shorter downtime. Great. That was very very insightful advice that I've not heard before with regards to pre-treatment especially because usually you would think that, okay, maybe my skin is not very, my skin is already bad in the first place. Maybe I'm just hydrating it, but I've never heard of putting like vitamin C for, to antioxidize to prevent the, the pigmentation from actually getting worse. And also thanks for sharing about the Pico second lasers. Yeah, seems like a new technology. Maybe we can explore it further later on. Okay, can I have the next question? So moving on to injectables, uh, because these are something that is going into our skin, a lot of people are actually are very aware or very wary of the side effects. Can you maybe explain a bit more about this? Because, yeah, I mean, if, you, if the question is asked like this, right, side effects of injectables like Botox and Profilo, I think, I mean, obviously, there are two different types of side effects. One is any side effect caused by injecting someone with something, and the other is cost of the product itself. Lah. So if we're going broadly like this, we'll just talk about the side effects of getting injected at all. So um, there are two kinds of, there are two different halves of it. There's downtime and then there's side effects. Okay, so downtime is stuff that you should expect to have. There are many, many ways to reduce this downtime and hopefully um, we use it to as minimal as possible, but you should expect downtime. Side effects, right, are things that you should not expect to get. They should not happen. It is because something went wrong, whether inadvertently or just went wrong. So, so let's let's split them up. Okay. Um, for downtime, for downtime is things like injection site pain. After after you get injected, the area is sore, irritated for 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 a couple of hours. That's one. Two would be a little bit of mouth swelling in the injection site. Once again, this is a couple of hours thing. Um, for very, very surface injections, such as Botox uh, around the eyes, uh, such as Rejuron, Skin Boosters, Profilo, you may get bumps on the skin. Depending on the depth of the injection, right? some of these bumps are intentional and it actually um, leaves the product in a place that you that is ideal for absorption. Lah. So, so these bumps would then take as, as long as it takes for the product to dissipate, that's usually a couple of days. Um, if we're really, really unlucky, you can get bruising, bruising like a, like a blue black. Usually this is once again a, a, about a week. The Interestingly, at our clinic, we have lasers that we can use to make bruises disappear almost immediately. But even if you don't, don't, don't do lasers to the bruise, right, you can just apply a bit of cream that helps break up the 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 components of the bruise and, and the bruise will just go away in, in, in a week. If it's due to a sharp needle injection, the bruises tend to be very small, like a small little dot in your face, so it's easily covered with concealer makeup. Um, so pain, swelling, bruising. Yeah, about that, about there, about there. Um, in terms of risk, right, it really depends on what, what you're injecting. So so I'm, I'm not going to like go into super depth unless, unless anyone asks specifically in, 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 in about it. Basically, Botox affects muscles. So Botox relaxes muscles. If your frown is too deep, the Botox will soften the, the, the muscles here. So the frown is softer, you don't look so angry. So what happens is that the complication of Botox, therefore, is the Botox relaxing a muscle that, it's, that it was not meant to be relaxed. So this is either due to injecting in the wrong area, it's due to... Um, using authentic Botox or no, other patient factors, and, and sometimes just inadvertent. So when a muscle that was not meant to be relaxed gets relaxed, right, then that's when you get complications due to Botox. So if, you need, if anyone wants to know the specifics, ask me about it. Fillers, the number one greatest problem with fillers would be to have the product injected into a blood vessel. So if that happens um, in the blood vessel that's near the surface of the skin, it can cause the skin to die. So that's like a, like a, like a burn 
basically the skin the skin is supplied by a blood vessel is dead. So then of course the treatment would be to 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 support the area while the body repairs the the damage lah. Um, but of course, the terrible thing is that if the product is injected into a big blood vessel that could go into the eye, you could get things like blindness. Um, the gist is, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible complication, but it can be prevented right by avoiding danger areas. If you don't inject in the areas which have these blood vessels, you will never get this complication. So, so it is uh, very important that um, you before you do any filler procedure, you got to ask your doctor about the risk that's involved and uh, be sure that you're comfortable with the risk because injecting filler, say, in the frown area or the nose area, where it's near to the blood vessels supplying the eyes, have a very, very different risk profile from, say, injecting fillers in the, in the cheeks or the chin. So it's not that you can't get blindness from injecting not in danger areas, but the risk is much, much, much lower. So you just have to understand what you want out of the procedure and what kind of risk profile you're willing to, to, to take. So um, lastly, things things like um, Profilo, Rejuvenate, Skin Boosters, the main issue would once again be injecting into small blood vessels because it's injected closer to the surface, right? So it's quite unlikely that you get big blood vessels. But if you inject into small blood vessels, you can still get skin death, skin necrosis. Um, and of course, if you if it's, um, how to say, there's also interactions with, with other products that's in your skin, like fillers, that, that could lead to lumps, Called, called, called granulomas, like little bumps under your skin, so that's not good. And uh, yeah, be, and, and of course, migration, la, but that is that is a small problem because these products are meant to move anyway. Very interesting. I believe that this also has to do quite greatly with the experience of the practitioner in this case with regards to Very avoiding much. side effects. And then with regards to downtime, it sounds like it's uh, something that should and should be anticipated to happen. Something like if we go for like the COVID vaccine and our hands all start to ache, it's something like that, right? Something, something that, that we should not be worried about, but something okay. that we should anticipate and maybe just wait for a few days for it to go away. Correct, correct, correct. Okay. I would say that over, mm. over here, we have very, very low rates of bruising. Mm. So maybe one in 10 or less patients will get bruises from any type of injections. Uh, but we still tell the patients, look, if you are going to have your your big event tomorrow night, um, maybe don't do the injection today. And then we let we let the patients decide. Because sometimes they're like, I really want it. Uh, if there's a bruise, it's okay. I'm going to cover it with makeup. That's okay. But 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 maybe just give yourself a couple of days of downtime just to be absolutely sure, you know, that it's not going to be something that's disruptive. Mm. Yeah, that's a great advice as well. So possibly book your appointment a few days, of, at least yeah. maybe weeks in advance in, yeah. in preparation for the event. Okay, great. Next question, please. So someone asked, how do I slow down the development or progression of nasolabial lines? Yeah, I love this question. I love this question because it's something that is it's always been very uh it's like it's a passion of mine la, about, about anti-aging. Because this question could have been worded as how do I remove my nasolabial lines? How do I improve my nasolabial folds? Um but the question was not, not asked like that. Question is, how do I slow down the development of the lines, which is fantastic because I think patients nowadays are more getting more and more well educated about, about, about all these aesthetic treatments, what they're doing to their face. And, uh, and, and, and I think it's a great question. Why? Because nasal area folds, right, are a normal part of the human face. Babies have nasal area folds, right? So, so, you don't want to eliminate the nasal labial fold. If you make the nasal labial fold disappear, the patient's face does not look normal. It doesn't look human. And the expressions don't look normal. It doesn't look human. It, I wonder if you've seen maybe people at work, your friends or, or, or people on, on social media with like two cheeks draped over their face. Very strange. So you don't want to make nasal labial folds disappear. But why do people get concerned with nasal labial folds, right? It's because as they age, the nasal labial fold gets deeper and deeper. So, so the, they see it as a sign of aging. They see it as a sign of, oh, my face is changing with age and I am looking older. I'm looking saggy. I'm looking tired because of that progression. So here is where we have to make a very, very clear distinction. Um, nasal, deepening nasal labial folds is not the cause of aging. It is the symptom of aging. So let me give you an example. If you have a bacterial infection of your lungs, 
you're going to have a cough. So the cough is not the problem. The cough is the symptom of the problem, right? The problem is your bacterial infection in your lungs. You're just coughing because it's a, it's a symptom that you, that you see, that you feel, you know? So similarly, if you have bacterial infection in your lungs and I give you antibiotics to improve the infection, when the infection clears, the cough will go with it. It will improve with it. But if I give you cough syrup for your cough, it will improve the cough, but it will not improve the infection. So you, this is a really, really important distinction to make. The nasal labial lines, right, is a symptom, right, that tells us that our face is changing with age. It is not the problem itself. So to answer the question directly, right, how do you slow the development and progression of nasal labial lines? The answer is, is it possible to slow down the rate our faces change with age? Which it is. You notice that when you're younger, in your teens, your faces don't change much as you get older. And in your 20s, 30s, your faces start changing. Every year, you notice your faces change by a little bit. And then when you get to 40s, 50s, you notice that your faces change a lot with age. Um, every year, it gets worse, you see. And sometimes, and these changes right, can lead to symptoms that make you look tired, make you look sad, angry, saggy, just not the, person, not the way you want to look, see. So why does your face change faster every year? Because gravity is the same, right? In your teens and in, 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 in middle to old age, right? Gravity is the same every year, but your face changes faster and faster. This is because our faces, right, is actually held up by a series of cutaneous ligaments and other soft tissue support. In it, when we're young, this support is very, very strong. So then the change due every year is very, very little. As this support gets weaker and weaker, you notice that the change gets faster and faster. So a lot, so I, I, as I said, I, I love this question because a lot of times people would say, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a fold here, right? Let's, let's fill up the nasal labial fold with filler. So there's a fold, fill it up. There's a hollow, fill it up. If this part is hollow, pump it up, right? So you are treating the symptom of aging, but you're not treating the cause. So firstly, you make the patient look unnatural. And secondly, the patient's face is going to continue to change with age. And then when the filler is gone away, now the problem is worse and they need to put more fillers to, to throw more fillers at the problem, right? To, and, and basically pump up the whole face in a very unnatural way. So there is a way to do fillers whereby you are not restoring volume, rather you are restoring support. So you are repositioning the ligaments, giving putting it to a better position that is a position where it was in when you were a bit younger. So what this does is that this supports the face and it directly treats right the cause of the aging. So when you when you do it in this way, the volume restoration is actually a byproduct right of the ligaments moving the volume into places that it was before when you were younger. And even if the filler is gone, this this better support, this better um, positioning will actually slow down the rate of face changes with age. So yeah, the long the, the short answer to this basically. <laughs> is that we have to understand that certain things that we see on our faces is a symptom of aging. Be because your face is changing with age, you see these things. So instead of treating the symptom, which is like treating a cough, you have to try to treat the cause. Because when you treat the cause, you will definitely improve the symptom, you look better, but at the same time, you are helping your face age better as well. Oh. That was a really novel way of actually explaining fillers because people usually think of fillers as like filling something. But for you, you actually mentioned that fillers actually restore the support that is actually kind of going away as time passes. Something yeah. like to kind of combat gravity in that sense, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So a, no, I, that's why I say I love this question because the fact that the question is asked in this way tells yeah. me that the patients are thinking about this more as well. Because yeah. patients don't, no longer want to choose, right, between either looking old and haggard or looking puffy and fake. Only two options. They don't want that anymore. They want to look like themselves, younger, right. and they want the face to change slower, which yes. is a much more natural way of, of, of restoring a face, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a really, really insightful, really, really interesting perspective into fillers and actually uh, injecting fillers in this sense, something that I've never heard before. Are fillers permanent residents in the subcutaneous layer? Okay, good. Good that this question came right after that question. Basically, most, most modern 
hyaluronic acid fillers, HA fillers, are impermanent. After a prescribed amount of time, the body will resolve the filler and move, and, and, and the filler will be gone. So no, they are not permanent. There are certain types of fillers that are meant to be more permanent, uh, but they are being used less and less nowadays. Lah. So the short answer is, no, they are not. Your body will resolve them after a certain amount of time. But an interesting thing about what we, what we discussed in the previous question, right? Okay, let me try to do this. See, ligament, fat. When the ligament sags with age, the fat drops. Okay, so if I'm filling the hollow with filler, then when the filler gets resolved by the body, the result is gone. So then we fill again. But if there is a way for me to restore this ligament and the filler and the hollow is, is filled by your own body's fat, obviously, which also reduces the, the, the fold here, then when the filler is gone, the ligament is still in a good position. So the results actually last longer than the, the longevity of the filler. So this is one really, really interesting thing we saw in COVID last year. We actually did a presentation for, for, for a talk for Indonesian doctors. Um, because of the lockdown, right, a lot of our patients missed their filler appointments. And um, we know that volumer fillers generally last 12 to 18 months in the skin. So 18 months on, right, the patient basically has little to no fillers left in the skin. But when we did a before-after photo comparison, they still look better than before the filler was done. So then you see that if fillers are injected well, you actually help the face age better. It gets better and better every year rather than the same or worse. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe for your regular dose of Asian health information.